Cities are at an exciting place right now. Bad planning after World War II left us facing enormous challenges with housing affordability and car dependence. But it feels more and more like there's energy and awareness about fixing these problems. But how do you turn that into actual progress in your city? Here are eight suggestions. The first thing to do is vote, especially in local government elections, for candidates who support denser housing, active and public transportation, and safer streets. City councillors and mayors have a lot of power over what housing gets built and what your streets look like. One candidate for Toronto's upcoming mayoral election promised to rip out bike lanes and immediately suspend further expansion of the network. We need to stop putting bike lanes on major arteries that are already paralyzed by congestion. Today, I'm pleased to announce my plan to get our priorities straight and to help cut the congestion. Elections at the state or province level are important too, because these governments control funding for major infrastructure projects, and more recently they've been at least trying broader housing reforms, like in Ontario, California, Colorado, New York State, and others. The second way to improve your city is to talk with people in real life and on social media. Extra points for real life. Explain to your family just how dangerous cycling is in your city. Refute that person on Facebook who underplays the importance of supply because of anger at investors. Don't obsess about convincing the person you're talking to, although that can happen, but rather try to get your ideas, examples, and arguments more visible. Work on breaking the perception of a NIMBY consensus in your city. The third step is to build a network by following groups dedicated to urbanism in your city. There's been an explosion in pro-housing groups over the past few years that are actually having an impact on housing discourse and even policy. Toronto City Council has voted to overhaul residential zoning bylaws that advocates say have restricted the city's growth for generations. Duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes will now be permitted in all neighborhoods. Tonight, the county board voted unanimously to adopt new reform to eradicate nearly a century of racist exclusionary laws. Most cities have advocacy groups for active transportation too, like Bike Ottawa. And there's also Strong Towns, which has local chapters or conversations in towns and cities across North America. Most local urbanism groups organize online, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, mailing lists, and often they have in-person meetups too. Networks are powerful enough that if there's any one thing you do on this list, aside from voting, it should be to follow, get involved with, or even start one of these groups in your area. Number four is to provide feedback on government projects and policies. Before going to council for a final vote, Toronto's legalization of small-scale density was put to a public survey to iron out some of the details and it actually seemed like the feedback was used to make the final policy more permissive. Toronto also recently held a public survey on pedestrianizing Kensington Market. As you get more comfortable with these topics, you can also sign up to speak at public hearings in favour of individual housing, transit or bike lane projects. Surveys and public consultation are among the main ways that Not In My Backyard neighbourhood activists have outsized influence on the city. I repeat that it is a privilege to be allowed to build and profit in our community. And fighting back on their own turf is probably the most important way to beat them. Sometimes you hear about public consultations from living nearby and getting a notice in the mail. But the housing and other urbanist groups that we mentioned earlier also play the critical role of publicizing these surveys and other opportunities for public input. Suggestion number five is to make resources or other content to inform and engage other people. You could make YouTube videos like we do. You could write articles on a blog. You could catalog the best and worst parts of your city by photo on Twitter or Instagram. You could do some interesting data analysis. You could put posters up around your city. It depends what you're most interested in, but it's really important not to psych yourself out if you don't have the exact experience. We never really worked with video before starting this channel. We've just learned what we needed along the way. Our biggest recommendation is just to try something, experiment, and see how it evolves. Think about contributing to the ecosystem of information and storytelling. We feature other people's research and experiences in our videos. Other people cite our videos in their blog posts. Those blog posts get shared on Twitter, LinkedIn, or other social media. Step number six is to move to a more urbanist place where you're happier living and where the culture and politics make progress on urban livability more possible in your lifetime. We're not talking about completely uprooting your life and moving across the world to a superstar city like Paris, Copenhagen, or Tokyo. 
If that works for you, then by all means consider it, but it's not realistic for most people. But people move to a nearby state or province for work or school all the time, and in doing that, you can try to get to a city with better public transit and walkability. If that's not possible, be intentional about where you live the next time you move within your current city. We used to live in Ottawa, overall a pretty sprawling car-centric place, but if you're careful about where you live, you can absolutely select into a better experience than average. You can choose a denser, less car-centric neighborhood with more urbanist-minded people and sympathetic city councillors. Ottawa isn't special here. The same applies to most cities and even towns. Don't think of moving as giving up. Think of it as strategically reorienting yourself to a place you can have more impact, while probably enjoying yourself more too. Our seventh recommendation is to make city building your career in some way. This list has been ordered approximately by level of commitment, and this is the biggest one. The obvious pathway that lots of people will take is to study to become an urban planner or transportation engineer, and that's great. But be aware that you're not necessarily planning or designing according to your own principles. You're usually working for a government, and you're at the mercy of their vision, for better or worse. That's why it's also really important to get more urbanist-minded people to run for office. Politicians willing to be a little bold can get a lot done. Quite a few big changes come down to just a few votes on council. Gainesville, Florida eliminated single-family zoning last year on a 4-3 to three vote. As a bonus, you don't need a particular degree or certification to run for local politics, contrary to being a planner or engineer. Another underrated career recommendation from Strong Towns is to become a small-scale property developer, improving your community one accessory dwelling unit or small apartment building at a time. Our final open-ended recommendation is to let yourself be creative. Just a few years ago, people probably wouldn't have predicted the growth of urbanist YouTube or the policy successes of pro-housing groups. But it seems safe to say that the next five to 10 years, we'll see more new groups, formats, styles, and ways of making change and connecting with people emerge too. Not everyone is convinced or inspired by the same things. So chances are, if you have a different way of seeing things, presenting, or making change, the urbanist world wants to see it. 